Hey guys, welcome back to YouTube Vet. Today we're going to talk about parvoviral enteritis or parvovirus. My guess is if you're watching this video, you've been recently uh, told your pup may have parvo or hopefully um, you've had the formal diagnosis that it is parvo and there's no ambiguity to it. What is parvovirus? You probably had a chance. There's a lot of stuff here on this worldwide internet um, that you can, you can read about parvo and I just wanted to kind of elaborate on that a little bit, give you an idea of kind of what this is and what this means. Um, this tends to be a virus that we see affecting young dogs. It's rare to find cases of dogs, you know, much older than a couple years of age um, that come up positive for this. It can happen and I've seen it happen, but that tends to be less common. Um, ultimately, this, this tends to be a, a disease of juvenile dogs young dogs that have not been um, fully vaccinated or have been incompletely vaccinated. Now what does that mean? First and foremost I will tell you that tends to mean a full vaccination protocol um, as recommended by your vet and in most cases that is a puppy started at about six to eight weeks of age, boosted every three weeks until 16 weeks of age with an appropriate parvovirus um, uh, containing component to that vaccine. It's usually given in a combination type of vaccine, but there are also ind individual parvovirus specific vaccines. Um, these dogs are also um, boosted yearly to every three years, depending on uh, your veterinarian as well. Um, and usually if this, if this vaccination protocol is done with a veterinary office, you will uh, benefit from the guarantee that vaccine company provides should your dog get parvo. I have seen cases, and I'm going to speak from clinical experience, of, of clients who have done full home vaccination protocols uh, with vaccines they acquired uh, through various sources and have had their dogs fall ill of parvo. Now, in those cases, those companies offer no guarantees and cover no costs if your dog does get parvo. Um, my theory is, because the thought is those are the same vaccines we get, the theory as to why we're seeing cases of parvo in dogs that are getting home vaccines isn't because there's any major magic to how we give a vaccine. If you're giving it under the skin in the right places, um, it should be working effectively. The concern is that there may be some issues with storage and handling with what's available to clients, to the broad public. So um, I think the vaccine, you know, although it's uh, certainly a cost to go to your vet to have it done, it pays for itself because parvo is not something you want to be dealing with. So generally, uh, parvo, to kind of get into the discussion of the disease itself, it is a virus, as we've probably already come to understand. It is detected by taking a swab of the oral and often rectal uh, or, or uh, anal rectal uh, tissue. We're trying to get tissue on this. We want feces and tissue um, because ultimately this is an antigen test. We're actually looking for uh, the virus itself on this test. Um, we're then going to basically put it into this parvovirus SNAP uh, test and we're looking for an extra little dot to pop up which tells us we're positive for that antigen. So we've got, um, we've got the virus in the patient. These are dogs who are typically from a clinical standpoint going off their food. They're having diarrhea, sometimes it's stinky diarrhea, sometimes it smells kind of metallic, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, a lot of times it's bloody, sometimes it's not. Oftentimes they're vomiting, sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they're eating, sometimes they are not eating. Um, but generally, this is a gastrointestinal virus. Now, it likes, this is a virus with an affinity or an interest in rapidly dividing cells. And the two places we see that are the GI tract. I'm going to show you some images here, or some hand drawings, uh, and the bone marrow, which I consider kind of a self-protective mechanism by that virus. By going in the bone marrow and suppressing white blood cell uh, production and release, this virus is essentially um, impeding the body's innate ability to fight it off. Okay, so it's kind of self-protective in that way. Where it seems to do the majority of its damage uh, is within that GI tract itself. What it'll do is, is basically wipe out all of the absorptive layer of that intestine. When it does that, we have a, a GI tract that is basically um, um, unable to absorb anything that goes into it. It's unable to effectively really absorb that. Can't absorb water. Can't absorb the Pedialyte you try to give. Um, can't really even absorb food early on in this disease process. We also have the capacity for bacteria that normally and, and quite rightfully live in that intestine to what we call translocate. So leave the GI tract and get into the bloodstream. 
these dogs can then develop secondary sepsis from that bacteria escaping the GI tract and becoming pathogenic to the animal, okay? Um, so what kills a dog in parvo isn't specifically the virus itself, it's what the virus has done to the body. That has created a state of dehydration, okay, by sequestering water and also in it, making it impossible for the dog to actually get water to come out of the GI tract into the body, um, as well as some of, the, some of the sepsis that can occur. So the infection leaving the GI tract into the bloodstream, okay? Let's take a little quick look at, at a drawing to kind of depict this. All right, so I've done a drawing here for the betterment of our education, know exactly what this looks like. So the intestine, I've drawn it with multiple rings because ultimately there's a few layers that goes into creating an intestine, okay? Um, but what we're seeing basically is this inner layer called the mucosa. This is the absorptive layer. It contains things called crypt cells, which tend to be the, um, the most highly populated point in this intestine with this virus. What it basically does is it, it attacks and destroys those crypt cells and wipes out the mucosa, the absorptive layer of the intestine. So you end up with kind of a, really a normal intestine is not this profoundly villous. And these are villi, which are absorptive fingers of that intestine. Um, but you end up losing all or sloughing all that mucosa, you get that bloodiness, and you end up again losing that, 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 that inner layer, you end up with more of this kind of, this chute, you know? So this is gonna allow water, Pedialyte, you put whatever you put in the mouth, it may stay down, but guess what? It's probably gonna shoot straight through and come out the other end without much actual effect on the dog, without much actual absorption by the dog. Or it may go in and stay in and slosh around in there for a day or two without being absorbed by the dog. Okay, and so the result, of course, is bloody diarrhea. So we talked about parvovirus in terms of kind of what it is, how do we treat it, what do we expect when a dog has parvo? You know, so generally when I, when I diagnose parvo in a dog, you know, I'll tell people that I cannot guarantee an outcome. You know, I would say experience has shown me that most dogs with treatment, if they come in in reasonable condition, can pull through parvo. Despite the numbers, you know, people can argue maybe 30% of parvo cases don't survive. Maybe 70% do. The numbers are not hard and fast. Unfortunately, with this disease, the numbers are heavily biased. The research is heavily biased by the fact that cost becomes such a huge factor. Um, being entirely upfront, if we consider a lot of these dogs maybe were home vaccinated, maybe in, in order to avoid certain costs, we can then also imagine if that same you know, cost constrained scenario uh, reemerges re in, the, in the event of a parvo infection, we may again be encountering potentially a, a financial burden that we just can't overcome as a client. To, to go through a treatment. And so there's a case where we didn't even get to treat. And so that was a case where the parvo was considered a, a parvo that we had to humanely euthanize. Okay, so the numbers in this disease are very tricky. And so a lot of times it does come down to your doctor or, or, or my experience and, uh, and how dogs do. And I would tell you with treatment, as long as they're not coming in too late, and there are cases where they're too late, they can do okay. A lot of times we'll check a complete blood count. So I said this does get into the bone marrow that blood count will tell us, is there evidence that this virus has already really shut down white cell production? If it has, prognosis is also decreased. We can also look at um, you know, blood sugars, liver enzymes, other body systems that are all around this GI tract and see what kind of awareness they are of this infection. These small dogs, the chihuahuas, the really small guys with a lot of surface area, they tend to have issues with low blood sugar as a consequence of this disease. And so we'll, we'll often be even weaker than some of the bigger dogs. They'll, they'll require kind of supplementation of their blood sugars. So when we go to treat these guys, that's really what it comes down to, we have to decide whether we treat them in the hospital or treat them at home. Now at, in the hospital, we can actually put an intravenous catheter in, hit them with pretty, um, pretty high doses of, of fluids, antibiotics, pain medications, nausea medications, sometimes um, certain types of vitamin supplementation. We have a lot of opportunity with those treatments. At home, there's nothing wrong with home care. If the case is right, your doctor recommends that in your case, I've had success with it. You know, we have to teach you how to use that subcutaneous space or the space under the skin to use injectable treatments there. But really using the oral route, giving them pills by mouth, giving them Pedialyte or other liquids or electrolyte things by mouth, while they may not hurt, they're also unlikely or definitely clinically unlikely to make a significant difference to their, to their prognosis. I don't think it's gonna help them much to be upfront. 
in most cases. Um, of course, there are benefits to certain oral medications and supplements, but um, you know, generally that is not our approach of choice when trying to treat these dogs, and it is, it is highly unlikely with a very sick dog that oral medications or supplements alone are gonna get them through it in most cases, okay? Um, so when we do get them, whether we're treating them in hospital or giving you the tools you need to try to treat from home, we're usually using an antibiotic. Why? This is a virus. What's an antibiotic, which means for bacteria, gonna do? Again, we're not killing that virus. We can't do anything for that virus. The body's immune system has to kill that virus. What we're doing is controlling that secondary infection from those bacteria that have escaped the GI tract. We're also using um, fluids. What kills these dogs is dehydration and septicemia. Fluids are critical. We're fighting both the fact they're not taking anything in and the fact that they're losing body water, okay? Hydration is critical. Pain medication, this is a painful disease and pain medication is often used, not always used, but often used as a component of that. Nausea medication, also very important. We're doing things to control nausea, hopefully get these dogs eating sooner than later. The sooner we get them eating, the sooner we provide nutri nu vital nutrition to the GI tract so it can begin to heal. Um, it can heal, of course, before that process, but we know that enteric or nutrition directly received through the oral route does help with regeneration and healing of that gut as well. Um, just thinking about the treatments we may use. Those are kind of the big ones. Dex we may also use things like um, dextrose, which is a, a basically a sugar, uh, external sugar source. Or if you're doing things from home, we'll have you pick up caro syrup or some other type of high sugar containing syrup for the gums. But with these dogs, what's important to realize is their recovery can be an up and down process, good days and bad days, sometimes taking a week or so for them to be back to almost normal. After that period, typically we say if they've recovered clinically, we'll wait them about 10 days and then try to get their shots redone. You know, even though they've almost created their own vaccine, we don't uh, take that chance. We definitely vaccinate them with a appropriate veterinary approved and, pro and pro provided vaccine. Uh, which will likely be boosted, okay? They can shed this virus for sometimes a month or more, um, but generally three weeks to a month of confinement after clinical normalcy is a good protocol to avoid these dogs than having a bowel movement that would contaminate their environment, okay? There's also heavy cleaning protocols to be done. Um, in most cases, if you've had parvo in your home, we're telling you to wait a year before you bring another dog in the house specifically a young dog or a puppy, absolutely no puppies for about a year. So this is, this is very much a condition that has a lot of considerations and it is something that um, you know, can be overwhelming as a client to deal with. So I'm gonna leave the comment box open below, but uh, hopefully I've kind of touched on, again, kind of what, what the Parvo thing is, why your doctor's doing what they're doing, why maybe it costs so much, because this is an incredibly material time and uh, veterinary personnel, intensive disease to treat, um, and so there's a, there's substantial cost associated with this condition when it comes to treatment. So um, please, any questions you do have for me that I can answer, I will. Otherwise, reach out to your vet, reach out to your veterinary staff, and, uh, and have them help you understand things. So we're all on the same page, and hopefully we get your puppy through it. All right, guys, thanks again for watching. We'll talk to you later.